Hi everyone, this is your Chess Puzzler, and again a very warm welcome to the channel. Each and every single game of chess is in fact unique, unless it is a short game and one where an opening line is played extensively. Other than this, the probability that you are going to get a game to be repeated is very small, if not zero. Engines have shown us time and time again how different one game can vary, and this Top Chess Engine Championship is such a joy to experience. I want to stick to the engines because there is so much to learn from them, and this is provided that you're able to remember what games or opening is played and how to continue from there. Division 1 is underway, and the engines to watch out for is actually this one, Anskax version 0.93. It leads the Division 1 games, and this is not by chance. In fact, Anskax is way far ahead from Fispo following suit, and Boot and Johnny are within striking distance, but are they really? There is a huge gap between the engines at the top and the challenger Fispo. Johnny is four points behind, and today's game is between Anskax and Johnny, and if Johnny can at least beat Anskax, he would climb this table. So this is the game between these two engines, and all the other details you need are already on your screen. This game was only played the day before yesterday, and what we're looking at is the Karo Khan. I know there are plenty of you about who love this opening, so here we go. D4, C6, E4, D5, Knight C3, D takes, Knight recaptures, and now Knight F6, encouraging the trade, and now John is set up to recapture in this way. Using E takes is the very famous Nimsovich Tatakova variation, but if you use this way to capture, I have no idea. <laughs> So I'm going to refrain from saying this is the Nimsovich Tartakova variation until we have something more concrete. Both Nimsovich and Tartakova capture using E takes and not the other way around, so you know. The G takes approach, as in this game, can only be the Bronstein Larsen variation of the Karo Khan, and this is what I'm going to go by. After C3, Johnny went for it with E5, but just to come back a move is really taken in this way an opening that is considered to be fair. Not sure it is because black is going to struggle. Let's see. We know Johnny went for e5 and now knight f3, even expecting the knight to be attacked. But it wasn't to be. Johnny lined up the queen and waited. Bishop e3 was the obvious response. And now the knight was developed, and the queen made her way out and to c2. After the knight rerouted to b6, the bishop got into d3, and we immediately begin to see why the queen moved into c2 in the first place. Amazingly, and against any principle we learn, Johnny Boy made another knight move, and this was already looking a bit on the dodgy side. Anskets castled, but this move risked the bishop on e3. But did Johnny go for him? He did, and why not? Having recaptured in the only way he could meant that Anskax's kingside defence was fractured, or if you like, fragmented. I think Johnny Boy got overexcited, if this is a term, the right term to use, and went for h5 trying to make a break. There are a million of variations or move choices, and anything goes from a bishop move to f5, to even getting the knight out to h4. Anskak simply went on and removed e5, trying to open up this position. When e5 was recaptured, there came the bishop, so it didn't really matter if this move came now or earlier. Bishop g7 reinforced e5, and now Anskak went on to remove the bishop. I'm going to say nothing about Johnny recapturing. With Anskak to move, the engine went for this rook move, so what on earth is this move all about, and was there a better move in this position? Though this move looks like nothing, hold your thoughts until we see how Anskax decides to continue, 
and here he comes. After the rook made his way to d8, any ideas how Anskax went about it in 2, 1, and pause? Knight to d4, and dare you even think about it, because if you do, just grab that queen, give her a big snog, and send the runaway to retire. After this knight moved to d4, Johnny got his lady the hell out of e7. And now with this knight move, the game was getting very tricky and we have only made less than 20 moves. Does a queen move to g6 work? You only need to go for a rook move to d1 and whether you remove the rooks from the picture or not. And let's take for the sake of it. Once the bishop is moved out of danger, because of the check to follow, once queen a5 kicks in, black is busted. a6, for example, is going to get the queen to sneak into a5. And again, whether you go for this bishop move to d6, after queen b6, even if you go for castles, once b7 is gone, the entire wing collapses and black is going down. But after this knight f5 business, Johnny went for h4 and now through h3 to stop the invasion on the king's side, Johnny went for this very strange a6. It was strange because it allowed the queen to get more active and once she reached this spot on e4, after bishop f6, which was a perfectly fine move, the queen repositioned herself to this lovely square and the fireworks were about to get started. Rook d2 followed. And what now? This game is going in circles. From one minute to the other, it seems to have turned by 180 degrees. When Ansgax looked to have been in the driver's seat, suddenly this rook move to d2 for sure has changed things around. Mind you, Johnny only needs one move to come in with the mate, and that will be the end for Anskax. Any ideas on how to help the engine? And if so, can you show? Rook f2 seems to be the logical choice. But after this rook takes, you may still be able to get this knight in with a check. And here is where things may begin to happen. For sure, a king move in the wrong direction is going to get Johnny done very quickly. King d8 is going to get the queen in with a check. And even if you get the king to d7, we know if white can survive this, he must carry on with the checks. Taking b7 with a check is going to drop the knight. But do this, and once the rook is allowed to come in with a fresh check, just look at how things have turned again. And that mate on g2 is never going to happen because there is another mate on the board. We know a king move to e6 is going to get the king mated in one move. And when the queen gets to him through d7, and maestro, I need those special sound effects. A king move in the other direction is not going to change the situation because a queen move now to this magical b4 again leaves the black king with no moves. And again, special sound effects, please. Now, if we come back, if now the king makes a move in the other direction into f8, we do have a pretty much clear picture of what is to follow. A discovered check by getting the knight to e4 is not per se going to drop the queen as such because the bishop gets in place. Okay, the queen can drop, but this is really game over for black. Provided you give up the rook first by taking g2, only when the king recaptures, the queen can be eliminated. And even here, if anything, if any engine is up, this will be Johnny Boy himself. But things did not go this way. There are so many beautiful variations in this position, but we do need to come back to the game. And this is a position when we suggested a move for white to get the rook out to block the mate. But now that we know how this game unfolds, what are your thoughts on White's next move? Let's try a two seconds countdown with the added benefit of pausing.
So here we go in two, one, and pause. And Skax went for the move of the day and comes in with a night check. This variation should not be new to you because I have spoiled all the fun already. Queen takes b7, did lead to the removal of the knight, and now for this rook move to f2, if the rook is removed, the exact same variation as before will follow. For this reason, Johnny got the rook out to d3, and now c4. Rook g8 was getting awfully close, but did Johnny take into account what would happen if c4 pushed on with a check? Take c5, and I'm not sure how, and if Johnny can escape mate. Rook c1 check, king d6, and now another rook check by removing c6 does it nicely. Because after this king move to d5, white can go for any move he likes. Best is this rook move to b6, which comes in with an auto check. And now after the king is forced to the only legal square he can, king c4. Queen c6 is not just a check, but the end of the game. And this time I will skip those sound effects. So when c5 kicked in with a check, the king was very wise to move into e6, but after the rook lined up behind his brother, this was a matter of time and nothing else. Rook g6 was Johnny's last attempt to try and get something out of this situation, but when the king moved out and to the edge of the board, Johnny basically had run out of moves, and this move to a5 was such a desperate attempt, and for what? Using this powerful guy on c5, the queen clipped c6 with a check, and now with the king pushing back, the queen moved in with yet another check. And only when the king tried to seek refuge on f8, c5 became c6, and this game was going to be concluded in front of our very eyes. King g7 led to c7, and through this rook move, which does basically nothing, Anskax waited with the queening and went first for this move, a very strategic and extremely well calculated move that locks in the bishop from any possible action. Queen g3 was a nail going into the coffin because c7 did become a queen. And once the queen came off to the rook, after a4 and now queen d7, the game ended with the king move to g8, and when the queen arrested this poor and hopeless guy in a4, and what another demonstration of sheer power this Anskax displays over Johnny. I'm sure if Anskax was assigned to take the black pieces under this opening, it would have been Anskax the engine probably facing all the threats. Thoughts and ideas very welcome on the organizer's choice of opening and anything else you wish to discuss. With much more to follow shortly, this was your Chess Puzzler.